I've been working in conservation my entire career, which is a long time now. I don't know if I'm at the apex or on the other side, but I started in Latin America working on tropical forests. I worked in the desert Southwest. I've worked on estuaries and marine environments, and I've spent the last 15 years on global oceans. And when you work in conservation, what you do is you identify threats to the systems that you care about. What is impacting what we're trying to protect? And then you design programs essentially to try to ameliorate or reduce those threats, change the way we live, change our footprint, change the interaction. We've been doing this for a long time, and I'm sorry to say that we are failing. We are generally failing. I look back at my career, and I don't feel like, like a success because almost every indicator of the natural world that we can look at is going in the wrong direction. So we need a new agenda. I now work completely on climate all the time from an ocean-based perspective. When I started my career, climate, the impact and the threats of climate was like this distant cloud on the horizon. It was just barely visible. But over the march of years, that cloud has become larger and larger and larger. And now, literally, we are completely engulfed in it. The problem is we can't see it. This is one of the biggest problems with the climate crisis and carbon dioxide. If it was diesel soot, we would have solved this problem some time ago. But we're now late enough in the process that linear incremental responses to this problem will no longer work. And yet that's where we are. So we advocate a new agenda for ocean and climate restoration. And I use the word restoration really intentionally because our current climate agenda of 1.5 degrees as a target is not restoration. That's being worse off than we are now, right? We're working every day on a goal to be worse off than we are right now. I don't think any of us sets goals like that in our life, right? It's crazy. And it, net zero is actually not the goal and 1.5 is not the goal. Ultimately, we need to bring this back to safe levels of carbon in the atmosphere and safe levels of energy uh, trapped on the planet. So we need to do four things. First, yes, we have to reduce carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as we feasibly can. It's proving to be quite difficult, and so it is no longer sufficient. We also need to remove enormous amounts of carbon dioxide, hopefully methane, and nitrous oxide from the atmosphere. We are well past safe levels. If anybody tells you there's a carbon budget left, it's not true. It, unless you think that the world around us as we see it today with temperatures hotter than 100,000 in the last 100,000 years, marine heat waves right now, enormous heat waves in Asia with all kinds of suffering. If you think that's okay, then we still have a carbon budget. If you don't, we have to go backwards, right? We have to clean up. This is a massive waste management problem, but that's not gonna be enough because we're now threatening the very foundations of life on the planet, so-called tipping points. Places like the West Antarctic Ice Sheet called the Doomsday Glacier that could raise sea levels by 20 meters if we lose it. The Greenland Ice Sheet, permafrost, coral reefs, all of these fundamental building blocks of the Earth system are under a great deal of stress. And we need to be starting to invent ways to buy time. Emergency medicine, and yes, AI may well be part of that, as well as other technologies we've heard about in these uh, talks today. We're gonna have to stabilize these systems. It's like, it's like going on a ventilator if you have a very severe case of coronavirus. The ventilator does not solve your problem, but it keeps you alive long enough to let your body solve the problem. And lastly, we need a much greater global community of makers and solvers in order to do this, right? We are gonna need all of the boundary technologies that we hear about in, in events like TED and all of the other synthetic biology, AI, robotics, it's gonna take a, a massive uh, movement of people to address the, the scale of this problem. Again, I look at it from an ocean perspective and now, now comes the good news, right? So that was all the bad news. There's a lot of bad news, but it's important to know how bad your illness is in order to create a course of action that's actually gonna work, right? So now we know how bad it is. So first on reduce, we're drastically trying to change the entire way that we operate on this planet and move away from what is an entirely fossil fuel based existence to one that is a, a zero carbon. And the ocean has an enormous role to play. In fact, it can contribute about 30% of that total 
transition, 30 to 35% through low carbon energy, low carbon food, new bioproducts um, from the ocean, and there's a, a wealth of innovation and exploration going on there. Second is the cleanup of carbon. The ocean is the largest carbon cycle on the planet. There's already about 50 times more carbon in the bottom of the sea than there is in the atmosphere. If we can raise that number, this inert carbon pool at the bottom of the sea by one or 2%, we could deal with our entire carbon problem. Now that's an easy sounding number, enormously difficult to do. The scale is, is grand. But these are some of the ways that people are investigating right now how we can use the power of the ocean, mimicking it, enhancing it, accelerating it, replicating it to move carbon out of the atmosphere and the upper layer of the ocean where it's causing acidification into the deep layer of the ocean. And then the last R, or the third R, excuse me, repair. We have to avert tipping points. This is a, a graphic from the Great Barrier Reef where people are experimenting with upwelling cold water uh, from the deep in order to reduce periods of bleaching when the water gets too warm, the use of surface albedo modification to reflex sunlight, marine cloud brightening, they're testing synthetic coral biology. They're doing everything, right? Because they know that, that we are no longer in, an, uh, in a realm or an era of protection alone being able to work. We're gonna have to have active intervention. The organization I work for, is looking at Arctic ice. One of the most important uh, functions on the planet is the, the reflectivity and the sort of air conditioning that the Arctic provides for the entire planet. It moderates our weather system, climate system, ocean currents and circulation, and we're losing it really quickly. So we asked the question, what can we do about it? Quickly, there are different ways to modify albedo, um, which is what's being lost in the Arctic as we lose ice. You can use sea foams and films, potentially reflective glass tiles, there's geotextiles. This is a brand new area of exploration. We need an enormous amount of new brain power and thinking to help, and engineering to help look at these alternatives, see whether or not they work. Some of them certainly won't, some of them may. We're at the point where we have to ask and answer those questions. You can manage ice directly. Uh, you can try to build ice and rebuild it during um, shoulder season so that there's more ice and more reflectivity during the summer and there's ways to um, deal with ice export we're losing ice uh, into currents and these are all again boundary areas of what i would call conservation for the 21st century and lastly and the sort of the maybe least palatable but we have to start thinking about it is literally altering uh, how much incoming radiation we're going to be able to absorb on the planet. We're way past, again, way past safe limits. And then our last R is reach. We are going to need all of the disciplines and we really need a COVID-like response where people begin to turn away from what they're working on now with their disciplinary expertise and start working on the climate crisis. There's no bigger issue really that we have to solve because our very our very future and the future of all the rest of the life forms on this planet depend on us solving this problem. So it's not just going to be a few oceanographers and climate scientists, right? We're going to need all of the disciplines, all of the skills. So if you remember one thing about an agenda for climate restoration and ocean restoration, remember the four R's. Reduce, remove, repair, and reach. Thank you. <laughs>